Hello everybody, um, my name is Alex Payne, it is great to be back with, with you once again for a new edition of The Good, The Bad and The Rugby. I hope you're keeping well. Um, there is no other way really of putting it when it comes to the guest on this week's show. We are dealing with rugby royalty, straight from the very top draw and no, I don't mean tens this week, thankfully. Um, if we were picking a team of guests so far in 2021, we'd be pulling together quite some side. We've had David Pocock, Mako Vunapola. And today, the most capped All Black, or certainly one of them, of all time. 127 times he put on that iconic black shirt, 52 times as captain, the IRB Player of the Year in 2013, two-time World Cup winner, and only one of 20 men to win multiple Rugby World Cups. He also captained New Zealand against the Lion in 2017. I think that's the longest intro we've had for anyone on this show so far. Konnichiwa, Mr Kieran Reid. How are you? Uh, konnichiwa, yes, very good. That's, um, hey, it's pretty cool hearing that little blurb that you're reading out there. It's pretty humbling, I guess, to hear all those things. That, which is which is extraordinary. I mean, where, where how is life? I mean, you know, the, the music has not stopped, but it's it's dimmed a little bit. Have you have you stopped and patted yourself on the back for a, one of the great careers in the game full stop? Or are you someone that's just literally moved straight on? Um, yeah, basically just moved on. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here in Japan I'm playing for Toyota at the moment. Um, so it's, you know, for me, the rugby life is still carrying on. I'm really still enjoying it. I think I'll, I'm happy I'm not involved in those high pressure situations that test matches, super rugby and all that entails. But yeah, just really enjoying life. And um, I've never been one to, I guess, to, you know, dwell on successes or anything too much anyway. So um, yeah, I've always just moved on with my life and, and probably where I'm at right now as well. I don't know whether you're moisturising twice a day, but you look about five years younger than I think the last time we saw you on telly. And I, I don't know, Hask, whether you need some hints and tips in that department. You're looking older by the minute, but... I know. How are you, Hoff? I'm very good, actually. <laughs> I've, I've caused a bit of a, a, a stir this week. Yeah. Uh, I've had my first viral video, which is uh, very exciting. I, I lost the plot on, on, on Instagram. And this is, this is the world of extremes we live in. All because I shouted a fuck a few times about uh, McDonald's and a few other things. We, I went up 15,000 followers in a day, uh, which I thought was quite amazing. But obviously, we don't judge our lives on that. I mean, we've got double World Cup winner, probably one of the best to ever do it. And, I, and I'm, I'm worried about followers. and He's just cleaning up in Japan. So there's different no, ends of the spectrum. good, I'm obviously very excited, excited to have um, Kieran here, A, because... You know, we grew. You know, we're. I think you're. You're slightly younger than me. Or we're the same age. Certainly looks it. Yeah, well, no, <laughs> we're the same age. Well, we played against each other age groups potentially on a couple we of did, occasions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, potentially. I remember it because I've got a photo. <laughs> he doesn't even remember it. He was like, "I'm sure that was a bloke I ran over the top of you." Um, no, but, but no, I think I heard you before, rather than seen you. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, now we're touring. Now the podcast has started. No, but I, I, I want to tell everyone because when you. When you come through kind of a, an age group rugby, and we're going to go through kind of your, your career, and, I, and it's it's interesting again because every time we get people on here, we had we had David Bo Pocock on, um, and even he doesn't kind of appreciate necessarily what the career he had. And one of my regrets when I finished playing was, you know, in comparison to you two, it was nothing. But to even appreciate what I had what I had done, and before you know it, you're in a different phase of your life. And I remember coming up as a player. You know, hearing about uh, Kieran Reid for all that's Kieran Reid. You know, and do you remember, I remember obviously I think you were in the same team as Jeremy Thrush as well, weren't you? The the second yeah. row, and it was kind of these two boys were sort of touted to be the, be the All Blacks. And um, when you hear about something, so many people when they're younger get hyped up, and they're never seen they're never seen again. And to obviously watch his career and then to be you know to have played against him a number of times to become a fan of him and then to look at him as somebody that I. Aspire because there was a period. I mean, of about well, your whole career, but there's a um, like a purple patch period where you were by far and away the best number eight in the world by like a long way. Like I, I you know, I remember and when you obviously won the world player, the year, you just could do no no wrong. And, and as somebody who kind of played across the back row, I spent a lot of time kind of watching <laughs> watching footage, going, "How does he do this?" <laughs> uh, and, and sadly not getting not sadly not getting anywhere. So I'm very excited to, to see you and also. What I, what I what we want to do on this show more than anything else is the Kiwis kind of have this mystique about them, right? And all of you guys, you even said it in your intro, humble, you know, we do this. There's no one bigger than the team. But so many of you have such good personalities that kind of, I know in New Zealand, there's a bit of like tall poppy syndrome where, you know, as soon as somebody gets a bit above themselves, everyone cuts you down. But I, I 
I always want to know what it's you know what, what's behind the door and I know you a little bit so I, I know what a good lad you are but I really want to see today just what makes you tick because everybody can watch highlights of you carving up uh, but I, I think there's so many unknown Kiwis and it's maybe a bit of your magical power just like the, the you know the, the ten the thousand yard stare the fact that you never say anything just oh yeah you're not yeah yeah no, no problem bro and then secretly what's going on like you know are you a party animal like you know what do you do we need to know this <laughs> Kieran, where, where would you like to start with that? Well, have we finished? Uh, yes. and go with it. <laughs> was, there an, was there a question in there or not? I'm not sure. Not, but, not really, no. <laughs> no, no I, think, I think that probably the biggest thing for me, if you go back to, I came out of a, a, a nothing school of rugby. It was a Rosal College. It was 2,000 kids. We had run, one rugby team, so our first 15, um, that played an average competition in counties, Monaco. Um, and so I came from nowhere to make New Zealand secondary schools, 19s, 21s. So I kind of, like, I, I wasn't mates with all those other guys then. You know, it was kind of like I was by myself doing it, just trying to, so I didn't quite know the landscape of what rugby could be. You know, I wasn't coming from a big school and um, had all this coaching. So that's, that's my background. I think that's kind of potentially, you know, why I wasn't really brought up and, and you know, really looking to, make a career out of it or whatever. It was just about doing what I could. Um, and once you got opportunities, man, I just wanted to keep going with it. Which is very interesting. So at what point did you, were you made aware that you had what it took kind of thing? Because you did have a very big reputation as a youngster. At what point did people start saying to you, if you concentrate on this, Kieran, you can go all the way? Yeah, it was, it was probably uh, under 19s, after under 19s. Um, so I had a pretty good tournament. We won that tournament in South Africa and Durban. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't know, really know I had a good tournament. I just enjoyed playing rugby. Um, I came home and I blew out my ACL, MCL. So basically, there goes my season. Um, 12 months out of the game. And during that time, uh, Canterbury came knocking. And that, that was probably, for me, kind of first contract to to go down to, into the academy um, and go, these guys actually really want me. I'm injured. I, I can't play footy at the moment yet. You know, the, the calibre of how good Canterbury is and, and the Crusaders, man, it was uh, yeah, eye-opening for me to see that and an opportunity I couldn't uh, certainly couldn't turn down. What's really interesting about that, though, is it, by the sound of it, were you, were you obsessed with the All Blacks as a young kid? It sort of sounds like yeah, it, I was. It, it came. Yeah. Like, oh, you were. So you were. We were. No, you were a rugby nut from a young age. I was a rugby nut. I was a rugby nut. Yeah, hundred percent. Watched with my dad. He'd take me to all the games. You know, local games every, all the time. Um, you know, but I just didn't know the process. Um, coming from where I came from, I was. It was about my mates. It was about having fun. Um, yep, I enjoyed playing. Um, but actually, probably, I thought cricket was my game. Like I, I probably put more. Um, time, effort into cricket while I was at school and as a young fella because um, I thought but, probably that was where I was kind of hit. You were a proper cricketer, weren't you? I mean, it's not just slashing it about in the field. No, like were a, you, were I was, you under I was 17? A yeah. yeah, like I made New Zealand 17s team twice, so two years in a row. So a tournament team. Um, like I was just a, like I loved it. So I put a lot of effort into my cricket. Like a, during winter, I was practicing for cricket. Um, you know, on a Sunday during the week, playing while I was playing rugby. So, um, yeah, rugby was there, and I can want to. I loved it, but it kind of came to that point, as I said, around that whole when I left school. Uh, New Zealand under 19s meant I, I got injured, which meant I couldn't then play cricket that summer, um, and it just flowed from there, I guess. What kind of a batsman were you? Were you sort of boycott, occupy the crease, or were you a little bit more flambe? Probably, I was a mix. I was a mix, definitely. I definitely, you know, 2020 wasn't around when I was that young, so, you know, it wasn't too big, but certainly I enjoyed hitting the ball. So club cricket, yep, I'd certainly be going for it. Representative, I'd probably just um, tone it down a little bit. And did you play... <laughs> go on, now. I was just going to quickly ask, did you play cricket with anyone who went on to represent the Black Caps? Yeah, played with um, BJ Watling, who's you know probably one of our best wicket keepers still going at the moment. Um, so me and him, same age. Um, Daniel Flynn, Anton Devsic all played in the ND side, so the team the team that I played for. 
Uh, so we all played together, yeah. And you wouldn't, you weren't tempted to do a Jeff Wilson and, and mix and match because he played one day cricket for. He did. Oh, he did. He played. You know, uh, like it was a dream. So I basically was telling myself, you know, that I'd, I'd love to do it. But Hask will attest to this: as soon as you play any number of years playing footy, um, my body's in no state to to get around a cricket field. Um, at all now. Could you even throw a cricket ball now? Because, you know, like when I was younger, nah, I used to play so, cricket, not very well. I yeah, couldn't yeah. even throw it. Nah, I can't. Like, I, I can throw it. So if I, but if I throw it once, the shoulder is absolutely gone. And you can't do it's it. So, like, it's I'm so funny. Even, like, my, like holding a bat now with my wrist, like I can't access anything. So it's just, oh, it's bad. But anyway. It's, it's very funny because I, you know, like when you're a kid and like you obviously forget that you're, that you're getting older because you, in your mind you still feel young. And I remember like I used to play all sports at school. I wasn't particularly good, but I play all sports. And I remember like that first stage kind of second year professional contract at Wasp going, oh, I'll throw a cricket ball, throw it, it just falling out of my hand and me going, oh God, like I just don't think I can yeah. throw anything anymore. Like even trying to throw the dog, the ball for the dog now, I'm just like, yeah, just under that. <laughs> just under, under, <laughs> under that. Yeah. Did, did you um, do you think it helped you that you weren't as keen? Because no doubt, when you were coming through, you must have met players that were just all they wanted to do, all they talked about was being an all black. They're obsessive, and you came from a school that kind of you wanted to do it, but it wasn't like everything about you. I think I like to, as I said, like I wasn't surrounded by these guys until literally my last year at school. So I was seventeen, turning eighteen. Um, so up until then, it was really just, you know, I was playing for Counties Manukau, which is my representative area, which was predominantly Pacific Island players. So I grew up playing with them. So, you know, we just played for fun, really, because that's what we're about. So as I said, yeah, I hadn't met those guys who were just wanting to go down this professional uh, life of it. So, yeah, I was just doing my thing. And um, it was, I think it was definitely an advantage to me to have potentially that background, um, you know, coming into a life of um, professional sport post that, you know, I certainly had to, hadn't seen a gym um, up till then. So <laughs> had to work on that. I think my first year in academy, I put on 10 kgs. Um, I was on the mass burner program. So it was, uh, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was a lot of work. I'm, what I'm loving about this is the contrast between the two of you. I mean, Kieran, we've spoken quite a lot about the fact in the past that Hask, I mean, technically you weren't, but you were pretty much expelled from school. Um, and I don't think the words golden boy have ever been used. Uh, Kieran, we're talking about the fact that not only were you picked out as a future All Black, you know, when you were pretty much in your nappies, but also you were, could have played for the Black Caps. You were also head boy of Rose Hill College as well. Is that right? I mean, we did, did you ever do of anything? Course as Oi, a child? Of course he was. Of course, of just... course he was. <laughs> Fuck, such you a straight shooter. Were you one of those <laughs> kids that just kind of shone at everything you did? I think looking in from the outset, yeah, I probably was. But <laughs> like we are talking, like we're not talking Auckland Grammar. We're not talking St. Kennegan College, which I did go for one year when I was 14. But we're talking a, a school that's, it's, um, yeah, it's a working class school. And, you know, I was probably, yeah, I did probably stand out in that school. Certainly a big, a big fish, but it was a fairly small pond. So, um, yeah, I could, could see why. Um, what, kind of a, what kind of a kid were you uh, as, a, as a youngster? I mean, were you someone that was studious, worked very hard? Were you pretty easy come, easy go? You know, what, what, how would you describe yourself looking back now on a young Kieran Reid? You know, I was, I was very quiet and probably just, yeah, pretty studious. So I was, I was good at school. Um, probably drilled into me from my parents that, I, you know, you had to do well at school. My older brother was the same. Um, so I did well at school. I didn't, you know, break any records in the, in terms of school books, but, um, you know, sport was always my passion. Um, I always just enjoyed getting outside and that was my childhood. And that's, I guess, like many, many guys. Um, so yeah, spent my whole entire childhood just chasing the ball around outside and, you know, trying to beat my older brother and um, basically, yeah, doing my best. And um, I think that's probably yeah, the type of person I am. Did your dad play a part in, in, in the, those early years in terms of making your brother, do you make your brother and you go outside and play ball? Because when we, you know, we spoke to other players, there's always this kind of element where the dad's outside kind of helping them or did you two just do it because you had a good relationship? Um, no, we didn't have a great relationship. Uh, 
between me and my older brother, to be honest. I don't, I don't think he liked me until he, um, until I finally made first 15 when he was seventh form, I was fifth form, and he, he was a, my captain. Um, and he, he saw I was some used to him because I was pretty good. So, <laughs> so um, is that right? So no, your brother put your brother put you through the tough love program, did he? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, it was a tough love program, which you know he claims every all my success because of it. Um, you know, and it's the type of you know he's the type of brother who we had a PlayStation. Well, he had a PlayStation where I'd sit there and watch him play PlayStation for two three hours, and then. <clears throat> When he when he finished, like I'm not going to sit around by myself and play it by myself. So then we'd go outside and just finally get a chance to do something. You know, he wouldn't wouldn't give me a go. Um, but yeah, it was uh, yeah for me it was just competing against. So my dad certainly had a had a bearing on it. So he'd come out and you know he'd roll his arm over and, and bowl to us if he needed to. Um, but yeah, predominantly we were outside. Spent most of our childhood outside, which was which is pretty cool. He wasn't pushy. Like, he wasn't like, right, Kieran, you and your brother, you know, 20 passes off your right hand, 20 passes off your left hand. You've got to catch 100 uh, cricket ball nah. catches. Nah. Just all fun. No, nah, it wasn't. So, he, so I think he wanted us to, to be at hit. Like, so his catchphrase was, look, you've got to go out there and practice. If you want to be any good at this, go out and do it. He, he wouldn't tell you what to do, but he'd say, hey, look, if you want to get better, go out and practice at it. That's what you've got to do. So, um, you know, so I did spend hours against the wall against garage you know hitting balls against garage or, or whatever or pass or just doing it by myself as well so and that was probably because from what my dad did tell me but he never pushed you he never said go on you gotta get out there what's your relationship like with your brother now to two world cup winners <clears throat> medals and 50 odd caps as skipper of the all blacks does that balance things out a little bit or come christmas you still in the small chair with the small knife and fork <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, know i still bow down to him um no, it was, uh, yeah, we've got a good relationship. As I said, like I was probably spending all my formative years trying to please him. And, and I guess when we finally got there, you know, it changed the whole relationship. Um, you know, we, he was great to me over my last few years at high school. Um, yeah, so we had a yeah, really good relationship. But um, he's still the kingpin, isn't he? The older bro. <laughs> <laughs> was he, was it, when I, when I, like, obviously I lived in New Zealand for, for a little while. And obviously some Kiwis are quite, uh, emotional some of them are quite like straight shooters like I, I obviously you know I was in in in, in Dunedin and, and, and you know I saw a lot of like fathers and fathers and sons you know shaking hands I always give I always go and give my dad go, go and give my dad a kiss on the cheek give him a hug right was there with your brother was there when you got your sort of all black cap or when you make the first 15 like just the most perceptible sort of you know nod or was that <laughs> moment where you're like we made it because I don't imagine he was like yeah. here uh, come in no nah, no nah, most definitely no nah. so my dad is 100% like that. So he is a quiet man and is literally the, the handshake if you're lucky. Um, you know, he wouldn't debrief much. You'd give the odd nod. And as you said, so um, now me and my bro, so we, yeah, we, we probably had a bit of fun outside the game as well. So once I made the first 15 with him, could go to the parties, you know, the first 15 parties. So he'd, he'd take me along and look after me and, you know, play out a few beers as well. So, um yeah, that was that changed the relationship. It reminds me of a um, a clip that Jimmy Gemmel, who's who's a great mate up here and one of the sort of Sky presenters, put together, which was um, Scott and Geordie Barrett shaking hands at the end of a Canes Crusaders game, and he put it up <laughs> saying the Barrett the Barrett sort of saying well done, pretending like they'd never met each other. They literally just walked past. There wasn't there wasn't an <laughs> eyebrow raise. Literally, handshake walked past. I, I just yeah. sort of wonder if that is. Kiwi man, and that, that is part and parcel of what you do as a rugby player. Or, or is that just something to do specifically with the Barretts? I think that's probably specifically to do with Crusaders v Hurricanes, to be honest. Right, okay, fair play. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think we like each other that much. Um, and so it was probably bragging rights. Whoever had beaten the other one in that game, you know, had the bragging rights, and the other one was probably very pissed off. So uh, I imagine that's what it is. Do you, do, you hug, do you hug your kids now, or are you like... So, welcome Pass to the dinner table. Yeah, yeah. Dad, Dad, I've done so well. You're like excellent. Thank you excellent. very much. Or do you, or do you nah, hug it now? Because oh, mate, no, nah, it's totally different, isn't it? I think it's just a generation thing. But no, nah, you yeah. you spend put so much love into your kids, man. So yeah, hug them. You know, spend so much time together doing that, which you probably never had growing up. It's just yeah. it wasn't how it was. But you know, now now it's just not like I put as much love and and 
and kisses, cuddle all my kids and um, yeah, so it's different. I guess it's just the way the world is maybe. My, or, dad, you know, tried it once. my dad tried it once in the, in the spirit of rugby at Twickenham. I came up, from the, came up from the game and he went, obviously there's a couple of mates, he went, son, I just went, fuck off that. And just gave him a hug and a kiss. And he was like, yes, okay. So I was like, dad, okay, right. what are you talking about? Yeah, I, I love that though, because I think it's so, it's so important. It's, it's interesting just going off on peace, you know, like, what you've achieved and stuff like that is so nice to just gone. Dad, I love you. And they're so like straight laced, man. <laughs> so, so I'm glad that you. I'm glad that you're bringing the new generation of emotionally open Kiwi to the table. Yeah, hundred percent. That's changing, isn't it? I'm, I'm sure it is. But I think it's a hard one because then if you show too much emotion, though, New Zealanders, mate, they'll come at you. They'll come at you. Um, so you just got to show it in the, in the right way, in the right space, don't you? When you win, supposedly. But no, nah, who knows? Um, hopefully, it just uh, it's how it should be, you know. It's you got to show emotion, that's the name of the game. I, I remember, I think, after one very rare all black loss, I think it was um Colin Pine Tree Meads who said the players need to eat more red meat. And that was his sort of that is how we fix this problem. And I, it, it is, it is, it is a thing, isn't it, in New Zealand that perhaps the men have taken longer to open up and to talk about their emotions. Than certainly up here in the UK. I mean, you look at Hask, he's sort of laser out there on, on camera 24 hours a day. But is that, I mean, do, do, have you noticed a culture change in New Zealand, even as a player and as, you know, someone who has been very much at the forefront in, in the limelight? Um, yeah, I have, 100%. You know, when I first came in, you know, professionalism was only really going for 10 years. So it was still fairly amateur in terms of the ideals and, and how people carried themselves. And it was pretty old school, you know. The old guys didn't talk to you. Uh, Haskell test to this, you know. It was so it was, you know, you, you just earned your stripes. That was how it was, um, you know. But definitely over the last few years, it, it's changed, and um, you know, well-being is is a big part of it. Um, and in in New Zealand, men don't talk to each other, and you know, you bottle it up, and and we've got some pretty horrific stats in terms of that uh, mental side of illness and, and suicide in New Zealand. So the more potentially guys who are, you know, in the public eye, rugby players are showing emotion and showing that, hey, yep, when you're not feeling quite your best, you can still willing to talk to your mate. Uh, it's going to be good for us as a, in a society because uh, that's what we want. We want, you know, healthy young uh, men, not only men, but, you know, girls as well so um yeah it's uh, it's crucial um across the board do you find that you you think more like that because you've you've left new zealand and, and, and traveled because you've had that experience like because you were an international rugby player and you've gone and played in different areas and seen that or is that something that's actually changing in new zealand oh it's changing in new zealand now yeah yeah you see that i think you know the guys coming through now the the younger generation they're attuned to it they understand it i think it's making sure um, you know, it becomes more than just words, I guess. And um, social media has some really great, you know, advantages to it, but it can also, you know, lend to some pretty horrific, I guess, kind of bullying or whatever it is. So, um, look, we just got to be smart around that and making sure that, you know, when things pop up, guys don't just bottle it, you know. It's, it's about talking, talking to your mates. And, um, you know, I had a good crew around me over my time, which, which helped. Uh, and I think that's that's the important part. So as All Black Skipper, which is pretty much the hot seat in New Zealand, I mean, did you did you wear that very comfortably throughout your you know your tenure as skipper? Was it something that you always felt very you know to the manner born kind of thing? I keep using that expression; everyone keeps pulling me up on it. Did you feel very comfortable as All Black captain, or you know, did you find there were times and days where you were like, Jesus Christ, I really am carrying the hopes of a nation, yeah. broad shoulders though they are. No, nah, look, you know, you don't want to ever be comfortable in something. But, like, I, I felt like it was my t time to be captain. Like, I was, you know, I was certainly ready for it. And I felt like, yeah, I could own it and be my own own man in, in that position. So, yeah, I enjoyed it. I felt comfortable. Um, you know, the responsibility is huge and, and expectations and everything's there. But it's, you know way you play the game for us and especially as someone who had played the game for a long time in New Zealand and and wanted to make an impact on this game um, so for me it was just 
yeah, it was a, a perfect chance to do that as captain and um, just wanted to try and leave my mark there. I was going to say, were you shocked at how much it wasn't just about being captain on the field, being an All Blacks captain or being a <coughs> captain general at international level? Because I imagine it, was, it wasn't like, you know, five to nine, it was nine to five, but all the time. Yeah. Yeah, look, it was, um, you know, watching Rich captain for a long time and kind of, you know, come in and I captain maybe, I'd captain the side maybe 12 times before I was announced official cap, official captain. So, you know, felt, you felt like you had an idea, but you didn't, you know, <laughs> when, when you're the official skipper, you know, it's, it's a different story. And um, yeah, it's, it's, you can't quite switch off. That's probably the biggest thing I found, you know, it was literally four years of your life where you're thinking about how to make the team better, what things can happen. You've got all these things going on and that's, that's the biggest one. I think that's, um, you know, what I've probably, I enjoyed it at the time, 100%. It was, you know, why you play the game, why you do it. Um, but probably the difference that I've really enjoyed since, um, you know, hanging up my boots for the All Blacks and coming to Japan and, and having some downtime, it's uh, been something where you can kind of just relax a little bit and, and just kind of literally just oh, smell the roses and, and just enjoy yourself, um, you know, a slightly bit more. Um, not taken away from from how good a feeling is when you you know when you play a test match and and go out there and play for your, for your country. It's interesting that you you, you you sort of kind of correct yourself there because you know like I the honest fact of it is I can imagine being an All Blacks captain would be the greatest honour <coughs> you know tingles up your spine like what a mega thing but I could just imagine the the, the fact that it's the expectation the demands. You know, in the in the UK, like I looked at with Dylan and, and other captains, right? You get blokes in blazers, right? We call them the Alakadoos, and you get old players, right? And everyone's got an opinion, and everyone's got a voice. But in New Zealand, where there's been so much success, I can imagine that's like two thousand times as bad. Like every everywhere you go, like I remember walking into news <laughs> agents in New Zealand, right, during the Lions tour, and this woman behind the counter went, "Oh yeah, no, we we figured out your defence," and I was like, "What?" I said, we figured out your defence. We know what you're going to do, the blitz defence. I was like, love, I just wanted to buy a bottle of water. And she's giving me <laughs> the breakdown on the game, right? Every Kiwi I know instantly knows more about rugby than anyone else, even someone who's never played. So for you as a captain to deal with that, even though you keep saying it's the greatest honour, it, it must have been like, at times, you have to go into a room and just go scream into a pillow? Or, or, or am I, or am I over-exaggerating it? <laughs> um, look, you're not over-exaggerating you know, what it means to New Zealanders, 100%, you know. But that's the greatest thing about playing for New Zealand is that literally everyone is supporting you and wants you to do well. So that's just, for me, it's the, it's the best motivation that you can have, um, knowing that everyone cares so much. Um, so just putting that into perspective, really, for me, like, and I'm, you know, probably naturally a very relaxed, you know, easygoing guy. So I can take those pressures, expectations. Yep, that's there, but look, I can just get on with my life and do what I need to do for the team here. And, you know, I was probably lucky I had those skills to be able to do that because otherwise, you know, it uh, would certainly be all-consuming. And I um, think going, going home, going to see my kids, they don't care about dad, the rugby player. In fact, by the end, they're saying, dad, why, why are you still captain of the All Blacks? Because, you know, <laughs> you're getting stopped for photos and everything. And they're just like, why? Come on, dad. Get out of it. <laughs> Did you? you might, what, what, the old, what were the older players like in New Zealand? Were they like? Did, did people contact you and say, "Listen, I think you boys need to be doing this," or, or, or were they quite good at like that? Or, or you know, when you won, I imagine they were all round you like, "Oh yeah." And then when you lost, did anyone come and put the knife in? I just want to know about that dynamic. Oh no, it's actually you know I think All Blacks when they when they finish their career, um, and I've probably felt this as well. You feel a little bit on a little bit on the outer, you know. You're done. You've done what you've done. What your bit for the jersey, okay? Um, you know, I've left it in the hands of the guys that are there now. I don't need to be adding any more of my two cents. So, you know, didn't have too many guys who I who I played with and, and older guys giving advice or doing anything. I think, you know, we know how tough the All Black jersey is, and and so I found it myself. You know, I've, you know, you text Sam and say, mate. Congratulations on captaincy. I'm here if you need me, but that's about it. You know, I'm not going to go imparting advice because that's not my role. So, and uh, I think that's the best thing about the All Blacks, you know, as a, as a team that 
um, and all the ex-players as well. I want to come come back to, to sort of captaincy a little bit later, but can, can we sort of almost rewind to when you blew your knee out and, and the Crusaders came in, Canterbury came in, you know, and I suppose the early days of your career, because it felt, I suppose, looking from the outside in, that it was the point at which the All Blacks really began to get everything together. I remember, I think it was Wayne Smith said in, was it 2004, the All Blacks lost in South Africa and it sort of was the watershed. And then obviously the Lions yep. came in 05, went very well, 07, obviously a blip. But from 08 onwards, you became just, just the most remarkable team, back-to-back World Cups. Just what were the early days of, of your career like? I mean, did you did you find yourself very warmly welcomed into incredibly successful setups? Did you have to earn your way in? Were the old boys hard and brutal on the youngsters or was it always very collaborative? It's sort of, you know, we talk a lot about culture in New Zealand rugby. Was that was that present from the very start or was that something you saw develop during your career? Um, well, to answer that, that last point, I think it, it developed over my career. Like, as I said, I think I... I caught the end of kind of that whole still amateur, we're professional but still amateur era where, you know, after every Canterbury game, we had a court session, you know, <laughs> we got on the piss and, um, you know, had a good time, then turned up again and just got on with it next week. But, you know, within a couple of years of my career, that was well and truly out the window and, you know, the, the nature of the game just didn't allow you to do that. So, um, Who was the judge in the, in the early days of, of Canterbury Rugby? Oh. Oh, oh man! Um, so that would have been Corey Flynn, um, Ruben Thorne, yeah, probably even oh, who am I thinking there? Uh, maybe a guy like Ben Blair. Yeah. Um, so quite a few. So I came into the academy and we shared um, the same gym as the Crusaders. So I was Canterbury Academy sharing the gym with the Crusaders. So you know, your Dan Carter's, Ruben Thorns, Greg Somerville's. Dan Carter's, all these guys, and I'm this 19-year-old, you know, trying to put on weights, <laughs> you know, putting the 60 kegs on the bench press, you know, just trying to <laughs> do my best. And these guys are kind of in there as well, and, walk, and I'm walking past them. And um, so that doesn't inspire you as a as a young rugby player. I don't know what, what can. So, um, you know, for me, that was pretty cool to be able to rub shoulders with those guys. But was it was it a very easy environment to step into? Uh, no, it wasn't easy. Um, if you can imagine that, like these are all black stars, and as a young guy, you you know you're shit scared <laughs> going in there, just purely the expectations. And I think naturally, it was a uh, earn your respect um, time still. Um, so, yep, they supported you, um, but until potentially you'd earn your stripes. Uh, on the field, um, then they'd probably pay a bit more attention to you. Um, you know, some guys were slightly different and, um, you know, would, would spend more time with and, and talk to you a, a lot more. But I think it was still that slight generation of, hey, look, you got to earn your stripes, son. And then, uh, and then you're part of the crew. Um, I was very fortunate that, you know, I got an opportunity to play games early on. So I didn't sit on the sideline too much in the early part of my career. Um, so got the opportunity to play alongside these guys as soon as, soon as you rub shoulders with them um, you know they're top blokes and you know they're wishing you all the best and, and doing everything for you so um, yeah it's fortunate on my behalf Did you earn your did you, did you earn your stripes purely through actions on the field or did you earn your stripes by going after people in training who you know you had to prove yourself against or did you earn your stripes in a court session, or was it a bit of all? Oh, it was definitely on the field. It was on the field. Um, I think, you know, we had a, a team that's very experienced. Um, and so if the young fella's going after the old boys at training, then, you know, it's probably not the way to do it, I, I, I don't think, from our guys. Um, and I, I found that out pretty early on. Um, because? Um, from, well, yeah, because you saw it happen. And then I saw, uh, I think it was Aaron Major, um, one of the young guys flew off the line, came at him, and he just let rip at him and said, you know, what the fuck are you doing this? And fucking basically hooked into him um, as well at the same time. <laughs> you know, you know, don't do that at training, mate. We play on Saturdays. We don't need to do this at training type of thing. So, um, yeah, got that in pretty early on. Um, I, could imagine, I could imagine you being like early doors like quite, quite competitive, like, like you know, not, not necessarily just competitive in terms of like trying to do your best, but being quite 
when we have an expression in the UK like being a Norse, like a fucking like Maratoji. When Maratoji yeah. t- turned out to England training, and we're like the older heads, and we're doing like a drill, and Maro's like running through everyone, fighting for the extra yards. Yards, you're like, right, I'm gonna have to fill him in. What a fucking <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I, I probably potentially was early on. You know, you don't want to, as a young guy, you can't be showing up, can you? No. Um, but I think I learned that pretty early on that these guys here, it depends who you get alongside. You know, these guys have played over 100 games for Crusaders, you know, plus 50 for the All Blacks and things. So, um, look, I was respectful of them 100%. Um, and it, it came down to just doing the work with them, I think. If you showed that you're willing to do it, then, then you know, you got their respect. Um, and then yeah, they're like, okay, mate, now you've got it. You can just uh, settle down now. <laughs> give us a, <laughs> give us a little word, you know. Um, so that's all that, all that was needed. Was there was there one player that, like, you know, in certain teams, you get kind of one player as a young academy guy to avoid? Because you said some of them weren't talking to you. Was there someone that just basically didn't talk to you until you, like, made the All Blacks? Or, or was it <laughs> slightly calmer than that? Oh, no, it's slightly calm. Like, probably a bit better than that. Like, I guess... Um, like a guy like Caleb Ralph, if I talk to someone like him, so he's an All Black, um, you know, hundred game Crusader, probably close to hundred games when I came in, um, and just you know the reputation that he's, you know, just does his thing, but you kind of can see him, and every time you're having a few beers, he's kind of just he's not talking, but just sipping away, and you know, he just it looks like he's just staring at you all night, you know, like <laughs> looking you up and down. Um, so, you know, he was, he was one of those guys. But then I also think, too, like, Ralph and Reed. So after a few away trips and suddenly we're sitting next to each other on the planes and then and and you can just have the old word to you. And, oh, yeah, okay, shit, he's not as, shit I thought he was an absolute demon. But, no, he's, um, he's, a, he's a good lad. So, yeah, there's a few guys, uh, I guess, like that. But um, most of them were, were pretty good. Were you ever guilty of that, giving it out? no. Nah. No, I don't think so. Um, I feel like I, I learned probably how I was brought up anyway, but I certainly learned from a bit of the stuff from my earlier days that um, you got to welcome these young guys in nowadays and, um, you know, really put an arm around their shoulder rather than do it the other way now. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it works well that way. Um, one of the extraordinary things, and it's sort of, it feels like, in the last decade, it's it's been stronger than ever before. But but the All Blacks sense of team always overcomes sort of individuals. I don't mean it overcomes, but it you don't see superstars step out of that team environment. Even someone like Sonny Bill, Carter, you know, McCaw, yourself. You know, if you'd wanted to be global superstars, I suppose, you know, it would have been quite easy to do it because of the success you were enjoying and the profile and the ability. And yet, it's always the team that comes first in New Zealand. Um, is that is that a very conscious thing that you work very hard on? I mean, if people step outside the boundaries of acceptability, do they get a clip, or is it just something that now has become innate? Yeah, look, I, I think in all we do, I guess, as rugby players here in New Zealand, the, the team is is bigger than the individual, and I think it's probably just as simple as that for us. Um, You've you've grown up with that attitude, um, and it just ha- flows itself through the teams that you make. Um, and I know, speaking from the Crusaders' point of view, like there's no way a guy who comes in and you know sees themselves as bigger than the team, they don't last. And you get to the All Blacks and you do the same thing. You, you wouldn't last, um, you know, more than ten Test matches. So. It is required of you. It's not saying that you can't be yourself and can't be an individual because that's what is the great thing about the sport. You know, you see these great players because of what they do. But how the team holds itself is the most important thing. And in, in, in New Zealand, that's just the way it is. Can you think of players who haven't fitted in? Um, I can think of players who, who, have, who struggled. Um, probably more so in the earlier days um, of my All Blacks career um, when, you know, we probably had bigger squads touring up north. Um, it was still potentially a bit of a top team, uh, bottom team uh, vibe. I think 
um, under Henry. If you weren't probably playing in the 22, you, you didn't get much from him. So some guys there would probably feel a little bit as if a little bit on the outer and, and um, you know, were probably more on a case of, shit, what can I do, you know? So kind of felt like they weren't part of the team, so did their own thing. Um, but probably in more recent years, I think it's uh, it's probably a showcase of how good the culture is in terms of the team that most deputants now, mate, they go out there and kill it and, you know, they're, they're playing probably one of their best games and for deputants to do that um, shows that the culture is pretty, pretty strong. Really interesting. It is really interesting. I just wondered, I mean, are there, are there ways and techniques that you use? Because there'll be people who are fascinated with this almost from a business sense, really. Are, are there techniques you use to get young guys comfortable as quickly as possible? Or is it just a, the nature of a successful team that if, if you encourage people to do what they've been brought in to do, they're going to do it? Yeah, it's a combination, I think. I think, you know, um, the best thing is, is you're playing with 15 of the, you know, some of the best rugby players in the world. So you've got one role to do. So that's essentially what we tell that, that guy who's playing their first game. Hey, look, this is probably going to, you know, in some ways it's the easiest game because you don't have to cover anyone else's ass. Just go and do your thing. Um, so if you can simplify it that way and, and just give them the confidence to say they're here for a reason um, and you've been picked for a reason, then um, why shouldn't they go out and perform well? And I think we see that, you know, more than likely it happens, um, you know, for us. Obviously, it's different on different occasions. You know, if it's a pressure test match, it's a, a lot harder than, you know, one that potentially doesn't mean as much. But, you know, your first one, you're, you're, you're wrecking nerves no matter um, who you're playing against. Was it different coming into the All Blacks change room than the, than the Crusaders? It, it, because, you know, obviously from what you said now, but obviously Graham Henry was slightly more old school. I, I got to meet him when we had that kind of time out in Paris. I don't know, you were there, I think. Do you remember we did the thing with Stade Francais? Um, and, uh, you know, it was, he, I got that more old school vibe from him. But was it more difficult going to the All Blacks change room? You know, when you're walking in there and you've got Andrew Hall, Tony Woodcock, Conrad Smith, Marnonu, you know, or... or you know, was it not as well more welcoming even? Um, oh look, for the first time, mate, you're shit scared. <laughs> you know, you know these guys are rugby royalty, and you're there for the first time as a young fellow. And yeah, I think it is still a little bit of that kind of you know you're just apprehensive, aren't you? And it's just um, you're wanting to do well, you're wanting to put your best foot forward, but until you can actually get on the field, you know, there's only so much you can do um, with these guys, you know, and it's just trying to create the relationships with them early on, which um, it's hard to do when you, you know, in an environment where top teams playing training over here and, and you're training over there against them. So um, yeah, until we kind of get those combinations on the on the track, um, you probably feel a little bit over there. But um, yeah, it was an interesting one, and I think you know I I, I made it into the onto the bench quite early on in my career. You know, after my first game, I sat on the bench for the next few tests and um, got a chance to rub shoulders with these guys and, you know, spill a little bit of blood, um, which gave me the opportunity to kind of mix in. Is it now that the, that the current All Black change room very different because of what you just said in terms of welcoming? Have you basically you looked at that and gone, right, we're going to put things in place that are going to bring them on even quicker so they play that, that debutante game amazingly well? Or, or is it still very much the same and just people are going to just earn their spurs anyway? Um, no, it is different. So, yeah, I think it's, you know, the, there's more emphasis on trying to get these uh, young guys up to speed quicker and get them in, involved as well, you know, not just having them do their thing, but, hey, look, if you're playing this team, you're, you're a leader in your own accounts. So, um, you know, have a voice um, really encouraging those young guys, I think. And, um, you know, that's really showing through, I guess, with the, the depth of, of players that, you know that all blacks have and um definitely at the moment you can see it our young fellas coming through and going pretty good but, but is it quite hard because kiwis are naturally quite quiet so i imagine the first team meeting right there isn't like you know like i can't imagine i mean like for example Ardy severe i love what he's doing with the podcast he seems to have a bit more of a you know kind of uh, a public persona in an england dressing room right the england team comes together for the first time 
right? They're like, right, get, you know, someone like me comes up. Right, lads, hi, my name's James Haskell. I do this, 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 right, okay. And there's like chatting shit. But how do you get young Kiwi players who are going into a change room with the best, they're in, in, in as, a, as a nation, you never want to be like above each other. You never want to say, I'm the fucking man. How do you, as a captain of a side or a leader, get these guys to go, hi, I'm Anton Leonard Brown and my five favorite colors red and I like, I like flat white. It's like, what, what the fuck do you do to break those barriers down just because of the humble nature of each one of you? Um, yeah, look, I think it's, uh, you know, there's a couple of things that you can do. I, I think it, as leaders, it's the most important thing. Um, so it's getting out of your comfort zone as as a leader and sitting beside them at brekkie at, at lunch, dinner, you know, and, and yarning. If you can create a rapport outside of the game and create a little bit, oh, you know, I know about Johnny and he's, his brother does this or, you know, he's got a kid um, who who's how old? And suddenly you've got this um, bond between you and that person. And as a leader, I, I found that was probably one of my greatest assets or strengths that I need to do was go and, you know, try and create a, a great relationship with each and every person. Um, because, you know, the stronger your bond outside of the game, it's, uh, it helps you on, on the field as well. Do you remember the point in your career? So you made your debut 08, I think, wasn't it? Was it 2008? Yep. Do you, yep. Given what you're saying about earning your spurs, do you remember the point at which you felt you could relax, not necessarily... Uh, you know, as an All Black, but relax within the environment. Was there a point where you thought, "I now belong"? Yeah, pr- uh, probably a year later. I think um, 2009. By the time, like, we had a pretty tough year. We lost to South Africa three times in 2009. Um, I was on the bench the first two, and by the third test, I was, I'd got a start as number eight, and so I was starting. Um, was the All Blacks starting number eight by then. And going on to the tour, I was, I guess, considered the starting number eight. And I think that's probably the time where I thought, yeah, I can be here for as long as I want to be here, I guess. Um, I'd also been given the um, the line-out reign. So I was, I was uh, calling the line-outs from number eight. Um, and... You know, I've been given this, these little extra responsibilities that for a guy who'd only been in the team for a year, um, it kind of gave me confidence to go, yeah, this is uh, where I belong. Um, this is what I want to do. And, mate, you just got to keep keep grinding away and, and keep keep doing it. So um, that's probably the point for me. The, the other question I want to ask you, and, I, I, you, you know, we're talking about two great players here, but um, just the impact of McCaw on the early part of your career I mean just in terms of standards understanding the ability to get away with it um you know how, how useful was it running on the tracks that that he'd sort of been through in, in the early in the earlier years just before you uh yeah pretty yeah pretty amazing to have a guy like that as kind of that person I could look up to and and train alongside but you know we trained alongside each other for 10 you know eight years at least uh, nine years, you know, from 2007 to 2015. Um, so all those extra conditioning sessions where you've got to go down to the paddock and go through it away from everyone else, you know, it was me and him, you know, and he's a freak. So for me, it was just literally trying to keep up with him, with his shadow, <laughs> you know. Why is, why the, is he a freak? In what way? Well, oh, his, his running ability to sustain, to sustain pace. So if you run a you know, do 100 metres in yay amount of time. No matter how many reps we do, he'll, he'll keep it at that time. Whereas, you know, for me, if I ran it at his pace, I'd blow out at five, six times, you know, sh- sh- I'd blow out. You know, I couldn't couldn't sustain it, you know. So if I, I knew when I was close to him, you know, when you're getting down to it, then I was as bloody fit because, yeah, he was remarkable in that sense. It was more, I guess, the mental side as well. So, you, you know, you do all this training with him, but... Um, all those extras that you do, all those um, individual work ons that we did together and just seeing what he did, you know, most of the time. And there's not one kind of training session where, you know, you, you just slack around. So, yeah, for me, having a, that person, I think he probably, you know, he tucked me under his wing and said, All right, you'll do me because we can work hard against each other on those one-on-one little sessions. And, um, yeah, so it was, 
yeah, for me to have that was was pretty cool. Um, yeah, it certainly pushed pushed me. I hope I pushed him as well because, um, yeah, it was pretty cool. That sounds like my dream. Like, if I could pay you to have been the third one in that mix. <laughs> <laughs> like, You'd have yes. to be in a competition where Mate, if, 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 like, Carlsberg or were doing, you know, were doing tra- rugby rugby training camps, I would say, <laughs> lads, I'm in. Did, yeah. just, just, yeah. You know, obviously his work rate is was second to none, but did you have that? Did you feel like he sort of took you under your wing or were you... Were you, were you constantly competitive? Because I know, for example, when in early days with me and Lawrence, like I obviously, you know, idolised Lawrence D'Alio and, you know, we used to train together, put head to get head to head. But as a, as a player, you still got that competitive spirit. So even though he wanted to help me, he still wanted to fuck me up when, when he could. What was that? Did you feel like you were going head to head with Richard? Did you feel like you were kind of in it together or was that a little bit of a spark every now and then? Um, no, to be honest, it felt like we're together basically from the outset. Like, I think once he probably, once I probably, you know, made it, started for the Crusaders alongside him um, and was competitive in what I was doing on the on the field at, at trainings and, you know, seeing, oh, mate, this guy's obviously got something. Um, it was pulling each other up, I think. So it was um, making sure that you... Yeah, kept each other at, uh, at that level. It wasn't like he was trying to really push me or whatever. It was just like we're both going, going at it on, in, our, in our trainings and, and what, how we can get better at, um, at different things, you know. So it was um, pushing each other really just to do it. And wasn't it wasn't a huge competitive thing. Like it's certainly, I think competitiveness was how we could get better. Um, and he was good at these things. I was good at these things. And you know, in terms of how how it gelled, it, you know, worked pretty good. Was there ever an occasion you would stay, for example, you know, watch a game or when you were doing a review and you would see something that he did and he would see something you did and you would come up to each other? Because that's sort of what we did, or I've done in my career. You know, we, we, I'd review a game and I would go up to one of my teammates and say, fucking hell, mate, you're so good at this. You know, can you just show me how you, how you did that? And that was kind of always my mentality. Was that, did you do that yeah. kind of sort of thing? Yeah, look, there's obviously some parts of his game, you know, that were... Unbelievable, you know, in terms of breakdown and, and fetching and, and things like that, which aided me. Um, and I guess, you know, Richie's biggest work on was his being able to catch and pass and, you know, how he evolved as a player of, of his career was incredible because, he, you know, he knew he had to do that. So, and it was probably a net, more of a natural thing for me. So I guess we complimented each other in that way. I think that's why we work so well together. You know, when you chuck a guy like Jerome um, in the mix too, so... Um, that's what you need on the on the track, isn't it? So, I think, um, yeah, the biggest one for me was the mentality that um, I got out of that. You know, his mentality was just second to none. Like he wasn't going to lose to anyone. The, the single mindedness, you know, if I go back, you know, before say twenty eleven World Cup, you know, in terms of what he had focused on, um, you know, that was all it was 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 winning the World Cup and there was nothing going to stand in his way. Um, yeah, so I got a lot out of that from him. Was there ever, just sorry, like, and I want the truth here, because because I, I, I've i had it the other way. Was there ever a moment where he would go off, not say anything and start doing extra extra training and you were like, fuck, Richie, I wanted to go in early. Like my body's fucked, like I want to have a rest. And then you felt like you had to go and do it because he was doing it. And, or, or, and did you have the conviction to go... <laughs> Now nah, just leave him because I've seen it where I've gone to walk off the field like towards the end of my career and vice versa with someone like Chris Robshaw or or one of the other boys and I've gone to do some extra tackling and I've seen Robbo like walk off, get to the edge of the chain and go, fucking husk and come back and gone, uh, can I join in? Was there anything like that going on? Um, Truthfully, oh, no, just... it's okay. Truthfully, you can admit it. <laughs> I don't know. There's... there's... There's probably been occasions where he's certainly done that. But to be honest, Hask, I've probably gone, fuck it. I'll just... Yeah, of course <laughs> you have. fuck up, mate. <laughs> well, you sat... You, you, like, so early days, you would have gone... I've just gone, I'll join him. As you became yeah. older, you've just gone... Go on, Richie. Good lad, bud. Yeah, yeah. Bye. Especially because he's... You know, he's he's already clocked up an extra 500 metres on his GPS in the warm-up as well. How many... Yeah. How fast he gets out there. So, Yeah. Because because he um but someone told me and I don't want to break the mystique that towards the end of the he didn't do a lot of training in the week 
so there's always one of those guys when they're doing extras when they haven't done Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday sessions, or is that or is that not true? Oh, look, you know, his body was pretty beat up by the end, so he had to pick and choose, didn't he? Um, oh, look, when he put his body on the line, he put his body on the line, Hask. So we all got to that, that point in our career, which is good. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, good. yeah. I never sense. got to that. I never got to that point because every time I'd go, oh, my back sore, they'd be like, fuck off, get out of train. I'd be like, okay. Was the, um, particularly amongst you, the, the Crusaders crew, I mean, you look at Richie and Dan, they, in particular, they, they're, they're pretty different people, really. You know, Dan is front row at whatever it is, you know. Louis Vuitton the, um, fashion show. Louis Vuitton fashion show, and, and Rich is cleaning his helicopter. I mean, were you were you all part of a flat white club post-training? And was there, you know, a real friendship there? Or was it very much kind of, we are very good at what we do on the field, but we're very different off it? Um, yeah, I guess um, we're, we're slightly different people, yeah. So Richie and me, like I think um, on the field, I guess, you know, it was uh, inseparable, kind of worked so hard together. Um, and I, I, I kind of feel I can and understand now that, he, you know, he was all that captain at the time. The pressures and everything that go with it are hard. It's hard to to make, you know, true, you know, like great friendships and stuff. And so we're... I. You know, I had a kid early on, so by the time 2010, I had a, had my first kid. So, you know, I was going home to change nappies, and he's still, you know, single and um, focusing on, on footy probably a bit more than what I was. So it was, you know, we're probably in different aspects of, of life, I guess, in, in some ways. Um, but, you know, great friends on the field and certainly could enjoy a beer after it, um, but probably went our own ways, um, you know, outside the game. So if you were to see Rich or Dan now, do you greet with bear hugs and grabbing each other's ears and brother, how good to see you? Or is it a firm handshake? Yes, we're back to handshake territory. <laughs> well, yeah, well, yeah, you go, Rich, he's probably a handshake and Desi's a hug. <laughs> right. But is that just your personality? I think maybe. So yeah, it's probably how it is. It's very interesting. I mean, I remember so I, I did your... Um, I was very lucky to do the 2000. And it's the only I, I I've only met Richie a couple of times, but I did the 2015 World Cup winners dinner the night after you won at Twickenham, and I remember Julian Surveyor um, winning try of the year, and I, as I interviewed him, I said, "Oh, congratulations!" And I've just spoken to Richie, who says that as you've picked up this award, it's a bit like a hole in one. You've got to buy every member of the team a drink tonight, as a joke, just to try and get a laugh. And lots of people laughed. And then it cut to Richie, who was sitting at the top table. And he, you could see him on camera saying, I didn't fucking say that. <laughs> and that just, just, it, just in that moment, you got a sense of the man who was only about the team and about how, you know, it, it just stepped outside the boundaries of, of what All Black Captain was was allowed to do and it was just it was just a fascinating insight really um to, to a great man yeah, um, Did, would that ring true yeah it, it does you know which is hard and I, I you know for me before i became captain it was hard to know you know you go mate you know come on out you know we'll go have a few beers or whatever but um when we're on tour or different things you know in south africa you know let's go mate but you know he goes out he gets hassled and um you know it's a bit of a nightmare for him and it wasn't until I guess, you know, I became captain and you go, man, there's so much on this and everyone wants a piece of you. You know, I was lucky I had a family. So, um, you know, two kids and stuff that I could use as kind of a shield, you know, when you're out and about, if you've got, you got kids. But, you know, for him, he, he just get bar absolutely barraged. And, you know, probably going home and getting away from it was, and he's got his outlets, you know, in terms of flying and stuff, so totally understand where he, where he was there if, if you now now you've had some time to reflect obviously sitting in japan counting the yen <laughs> lying probably on a yen a yen mattress i imagine um do you look back at your your captaincy and think um or you're all best is there anything you would have done differently in terms of now what you know um and how and you've had an out you know an outside looking in yeah there's not nothing i'd do differently like there's obviously you look at individual weeks of you know, games we lost and, and things like that. And you go, man, of course there's things you could do differently. Um, you know, but that's hindsight. That's just looking back on things. But, you know, I've come to to know that, you know, I put everything in across my career and definitely across my captaincy um, to try and get the best results possible. You know, and there's, there's things there that you go, oh, man, you could have done this, could have done that. But 
Look, I, I haven't really worried about them because, you know, I know at the time I put so much effort and, and everything into it that, you know, it sits, it sits pretty true of me. The reason I ask that is because, is, is because David Pocock, for example, he said, you know, hindsight in terms of playing and the way he did things, like you said, it's just reflection. One thing he regretted, he said, was that he wasn't more kind of engaging with other teams, other players, um, and was sort of, you know, kind of so focused on the task in hand that he didn't necessarily build those relationships around. I, I know with the All Blacks team, because you guys won most of the time, it was like pretty much smiles but did you did you feel that you you could have engaged more with people or are you comfortable with all that kind of stuff oh yeah look i guess on that perspective like it would be great if you could en enjoy each other's company a bit more I, I you know i i just felt it so difficult to try and do you know like you know we'd play england once a year you know we'd have a, a couple of you know a series in new zealand where you play a few games but um you know and you'd you'd literally see them up at a you know, shirt and tight dinner where, you know, you always just want to get out of there or whatever. And um, it was hard to, to engage. I just think it's, you know, it's probably the thing that I, I miss most or, or feel like you talk to guys from back in the day and they're like, man, how much engagement they had with the opposition. Um, and certainly I felt we got that with certain teams, you know, like Safco was a team that we, you know, we always seemed to play them where we could have a few beers after the game and enjoy ourselves. Um, but if you got it next week, it's always hard, isn't it, um, to do that? So it would be nice to do. And like, hopefully, um, you know, in my future, you know, I can get around and I can just call someone up from a team I've play, played against and, you know, and go and catch up. So I'm looking forward to doing that. Well, judging by what happens at the World Cups and the fact that we, we covered the, uh, the, the, obviously, the 2019 World Cup uh, for House of Rugby, uh, our old podcast. And um, we went out there, and basically all the old legendary players, I think for the entire time, like I don't know how many days, like 48 days, they spent on the piss together. Like, it's like they wouldn't, there was never any competition against any of them. The only competition was could they keep standing. So I think... If you, you know, <laughs> having won two World Cups yeah. and, and liking yeah. a little beer or, or, or a little stubby or two, you are going to be absolutely fine in that respect. The only problem is they had a World Cup winners group. So I was allowed in. <laughs> I was allowed in. I was oh. like, lads, can I, can I come for a beer? They're like, no, I'm sorry, you can't. Yeah. Ask was working in the cloakroom. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh. Where are your winners medals nowadays? Where do you, where do you keep them? Um, oh, they're on a, they're on a shelf at home somewhere. Um, I love it. Yep, yep. No, so they, they are. They're not out. So they're probably in their case, but they're probably on a yeah on a shelf somewhere. Huh? Um, and when I say 2011 to you, you feel you think you remember what? Ah, uh, ecstasy mixed with relief. So many, so many people who were part of that, just as fans, broadcasters, they all talk about relief which is an yeah. extraordinary emotion to go to. It's amazing. It's amazing, you know, because you go, well, shouldn't this be the, you know, the best moment of your life, like that whole ecstasy. And I, I think at that time when it um, final whistle went, for me it was, you know, like I, all the, in terms of the 24 years for me that we hadn't won, like I hadn't been involved in previous World Cups. So this was it for me. This is my one, one turn, whereas a lot of, a lot of guys who had been to 03, 07, obviously, it was all on them. But, mate, the pressure was, in terms, like, if you look, walked around New Zealand at that time, and, you know, there was no way we could lose um, and, and walk back out and walk through New Zealand for the next year or so or however long, you know, we just couldn't. So that's where, where the relief comes from. It's extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, did you enjoy 2011 or was it something you kind of feel you went through? No, I enjoyed it. So, <clears throat> as I said, like, that was my first experience at a World Cup and I, I, went into the, I went into the World Cup with a high ankle sprain, Cindus Moses, so I missed our first three games. So I got, um, you know, it was probably touch and go to, to play our fourth pool game, even make the quarterfinal when, when I got injured um, two weeks before the comp before the World Cup. So I got to go to our opening game, watch the opening ceremony from a different perspective that I wouldn't have got to head of us playing. So I was just out there as a fan, you know, seeing what was going on. So I got a 
quite a cool perspective in, in terms of that, of what it meant to all New Zealanders. You know, I wasn't just right in my cocoon of blocking out all these extra things. So um, that was a cool part of it. Um, and then obviously coming back onto the field and the impact of it and knowing what it meant. And then just the whole World Cup was pretty special in terms of the crowds and involvement and everything. And then when we talk about 2015, the emotions of what? Probably like our oh, pride and... Um, yeah, I think pride is probably the biggest one. I think, you know, we were undoubtedly the best team in the world for the last four years. Um, and it was, but it was still going to be a World Cup where you got to win three games in a row, whatever it was. And it's a one-off game. So you lose, you're out. So it doesn't matter if you're the best team in the world, you can lose and you're, you're, you're gone. So, um, but I, I felt in that World Cup that we had such a confidence within the group and we actually didn't play that well in the, our pool stages and, you know, people were coming out, back home in New Zealand were coming at us in the media and everything. Um, yet within our within our four walls as a team, you know, we're so confident um, in our ability and who we had and, and what we're um, going to do. So, in, in that sense, you know, it was it was so stark the differences for me in the bus to the 2011 World Cup final compared to the 2015 World Cup final. Um, the nervous wreck I was in 11 compared to this guy to actually, you know, look around and actually enjoy this thing in 2015. Wasn't arrogant, but just confident of what we could do as a team. And I think, um, yeah, there's quite big differences um, within those two, those two uh, World Cups. That is really interesting. Which was the better celebration? Oh, 15 went longer because it went across a few time zones. Um <laughs> Yeah, uh, they were both pretty special. So 2015, so 2011, I went in with an ankle injury. 2015, I came out uh, with an ankle injury from the final. So I broke my kind of foot, did my ankle ligaments. So I was in a moon boot for all those <laughs> celebrations, um, which was, yeah, they're both pretty special, man. They're pretty, pretty cool. Um, yeah, awesome fun. I bet. Um when I say the name Ken Owens to you, your reaction is? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's funny. It's funny. Um, no, he's a good man. I've actually, you know, um, spoken to him, you know, a few times. I appreciate him as a, as a player and, and what he does as a team. But um, yeah, it's funny. I don't... Get, out of, get out of your media handbook. When I say <laughs> the name of Ken Owens to you. <laughs> well... I, I I did a video for him for his. I think he became the most cap. Did he play for the Scarlet Ospreys or something? Yeah. Um, yeah. Scarlet. Uh, and yeah, so I did a video for him for a wee while back, and that was probably the first time I kind of even thought about you know the connection um, between him and say my career. You know, Lions. It's got nothing to do with Ken Owens. It's got a lot to do with the referee. Um, <laughs> that would bring us stronger. That would probably bring us stronger. Have you done a video for Roman Poit or not? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I've seen him since, um, and he hasn't acknowledged anything. Um, <laughs> so... Wait, I love, I love how you're still like, do you know what I mean? Even though you're like putting a brave face to it, I could just feel the pure like fucking fury. Like, yeah, no, he hasn't uh, fucking acknowledged it. I love it. I love it. That's, nah, that's, so... why, you're so, that's why you're so good because you're so competitive. I fucking love this. Oh man, it's a funny one, eh? Like, oh, it's 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 just fine margins, and it just tells us. And it's like, there's there's things you could try and change, you would, you know. But it's how, man. It's like those things that you look back on. And so, as I said, like I'm pretty one to go. Okay, that was what it was. Um, shit, you wish that it was a different outcome or whatever it was, but hey, it is what it was. I can move on, and I'm happy with that as well. So, yeah, if that's what uh, you no tell yourself. About that. That. That's yeah, what you're yeah, telling yourself, because I don't think you have moved it. on. I don't think you nah, have moved on. <laughs> no, nah, honestly, I have. So it's um, it's honestly fine. You kind of realise well, it. You... Um, so it's sweet. Do you, do you feel robbed in that instance? Do you, do, do you feel the Lions... I know you've moved on, but when you look back now, do you feel the wrong outcome was the outcome? No, nah, I don't think so. Um, I don't think it was the wrong outcome. I feel, like if I look back on it, I felt we were we could have been the better team, but I don't think we were the better team. Um, you know, we weren't the better team because we didn't 
um, finish our opportunities and, and score the tries that we could have done. So I think the right outcome probably was the what happened. You know, um, the lines are bloody good, um, and so that's how it was. So I kind of so when I look back on it at the time, I thought it was a, a bad outcome and um, it was the wrong outcome because you know we should refereeing decisions or we should have been better or whatever but um, looking back you know I feel it was probably a fair reflection. What I was going to ask sorry Karen was, was do, you know when you said you, you look back at Roman Park do you think you could have done something different that's what that's what I picked up on in terms of you know in reflection have you thought I could have used different language I could have been more forceful was that kind of thing you were thinking about? Yeah I, like I, I did reflect on that like it was um you know, but I look at it and I go, well, I don't know what else I could really do as a captain. You know, if you look at that, um, go back and 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 see it. Um, and it was, yeah, just one of those bizarre ones that you just got to deal with at the time. Um, we still had a chance. That was the kind of thing that irked me probably more that we had a chance we didn't quite um, nail it after. So, but it is what it is, eh? It's rugby, mate. It's, um, I was listen. I was it, in the stand. It's giving, not a high performance sport and everything. So yeah, mate. I was in the stand giving Rory Best son chips. So I was. I was so <laughs> far away from having any impact on anything. But I. I mean, I. You know, at the time we were sitting in the stand, I didn't even know that you could draw. That was the best bit. I don't. I don't know if you guys knew it on the field, but we we had no idea. We were standing there going, "Oh, brilliant, extra time!" And then went, "Yeah, that nah, game's over." We're like, "What? How can you fucking end the game like that?" No, well, I remember, so I'd um, seen you that night, you know, in the uh, ceremony after it, um, you know, and it was more, it was, it was quite bizarre, eh? It was kind of like, because you kind of go through a series like that and as if you kind of hate each other, <laughs> you know, like it's, and it's quite, it's kind of weird. And I think, because um, you respect um, the players and, and all those teams, and but you just don't get a chance to actually sit down and, and talk to each other and go, you know, oh, mate, how big is this and how much pressure is on these games and just to kind of share that, um, which uh, I guess is probably, you know, it would have been nice to be able to do a bit more of that, you know, um, across the board. But, um, you know, the nature of it is coaches don't want you mixing and mingling, mate. They want you hating each other when you go out to play the game. But um, yeah, there's two ways of doing that. Do you remember that evening, though? I actually completely forgot. I'm, you know, that we ended up having this exact conversation, didn't we? Just to catch up going, look, yeah. we've been here for... Yeah. You know, nine weeks, and we haven't seen you once. Like, ha, ha, you know what's happening. Obviously, I didn't play the the the, the crusade. I didn't play any of the big games. <laughs> I was more I was more uh, social secretary slash entertainment. Um, but it it was weird because yeah, we sat in that sort of thing and had a couple of beers together. And I remember speaking to to Sam Whitelock and Sam Kane and being like, you know, uh, I can't believe we've confined our interaction to one evening when it would have been so good. Because you know, there's, there's no way that I, I could have met you for a coffee if I had been good enough to be in the test team. If I could met you for a coffee and had a flat white, we'd had a yarn, and then yeah. not wanted to go full, full, you know, full goo on the weekend. Like I don't, I, it wouldn't have ever affected my mentality. It is such a shame that we sort of have these like snatch ten minute conversations. That I can see after a while you're looking at me going, "Does he ever shut the fuck up?" Then you walk <laughs> off and see your family, and then I move on to the next person. <laughs> um. Yeah, look, mate, I think it's that's probably a little bit of the way the game's gone. And I, I think that it is a little bit of a shame. Um, you know, it's, and maybe it, it, it shouldn't affect you. Eh? Like, I, I remember back in the day with South Africa, we'd go for a promo and we'd be cooking a bro with each other on a Thursday and then playing on a Saturday. And as you said, we're professional players. You know, it doesn't matter. You can enjoy each other's company, but you get on that field. And you're going hammer and tongs, so it doesn't matter. When you look back now, I mean, are you are you comfortable with with the, the all black music stopping? Do you do you miss it enormously? Is it been and gone, and you don't think too much about it? Yeah, I'm. I'm I, don't, I don't miss it. I uh, yeah, I'm pretty happy to be where I'm at right now. Um, you know, I'm stoked for what I did over my career, um, but you know, there's a big part of me that kind of yeah, certainly doesn't miss the pressures and, and miss the expectations of, of it all um, and can kind of just be be a dad again and, and just enjoy my footy which I'm doing here in Japan and um, it's the first time in a long time that you can go to training 
you know, train, whatever. As soon as you get in the car to come home, you don't even think about the game anymore. Um, so I've really enjoyed that um, part of, part of uh, I guess, my rugby career now. Because you said in a, sorry, Adel, you said, you said in a quote, actually, something along those lines, you said, that, you know, we don't watch rugby at home, we don't talk about rugby. You know, is that, is that, is that always the case? Or, or is that something you're, you're really relishing at the moment where you're coming back and you're just like, you know, I don't need to worry about this? <laughs> yeah. Um, no, so, uh, you know, we never talked about rugby at home when I was, um, you know, still playing with the All Backs and stuff. Like my wife is in it. You know, she supports me, but doesn't know rugby and doesn't care about it <laughs> in a sense. And, and uh, my eldest kids are girls. And to be honest, they, they know as rugby is the thing that takes dad away. They know as rugby is the thing that when we're out and about, people are staring and talking and wanting photos and stuff. So, um, yeah, rugby is the last thing that they want to be talking about. So, which was always great for me, I think. It was a great balance, you know. You know, but you couldn't, you can't get it out of your head, though, can you? You know, you're going home and it's in your head and you're and you're thinking about it um, because that's what you want to do. It's what you're doing. Um, whereas here, hey, I was just playing a game, you know, because I still enjoy it and it's a team game. That, that those those things that you enjoy, but none of the extra stuff that that's going on. Do you know how many fans and um, kind of young players who, who will listen to this will be shocked by the fact that you, you are able to kind of put your rugby in one box here and not bring it home with you? Because I think there's this perception that you have to be on it 24 hours a day, that you can't have um, another avenue. And I think it's so good to hear that. Because I, you know, I don't know what I thought, but I thought if you're in New Zealand... You, you, you train rugby, you're in the car, you listen to a rugby show, you get in, everyone in the family's dressed up as all blacks and you're like scrummaging and, <laughs> scrummaging and misses and she's, like got, <laughs> she's got like a PowerPoint presentation of like where you could have been better off the base of the scrum. But I love the fact that, that this is what I, you know, because people will just put the all blacks in such a mystique, you bring the shutter back and you go, fucking hell, they're just really good lads. They actually can have the balance right, but it was there a time in your career when you, you didn't get it right and you, you, you were like, fuck, I'm on this 24 hours a day? Yeah, I think for me it was probably early days in my captaincy where um, I was probably more when I was away from home, you know, and, and you're all the guys are together. So, you you know, you're going from trainings, you know, so you're getting going to the coach and having a yarn to him. You're going, talking to players about different things and, mate, you get to the end of the day and you're just burnt out because you're... Um, you know, talking about all this footy. And, but so by the time I realised that, literally I struck just some time to go with the lads and play some cards and go have a coffee or, um, you know, get away from it. It's so much beneficial for your, for your own game and, and for the performance on a Saturday if you can get that balance right. And, um, you know, as a, for the most part, I, I was pretty good at that. And, um, you know, I do my thing in terms of the rugby and then get away and, and try and focus on something else. Conscious of your time, um, it's probably bedtime with you. It might, might yeah. even be the middle of the night. But, um, just, just three, three questions to finish with. I'd love to know about you in those moments before you walk out to Eden Park, LS Park, Twickenham, etc. Were you somebody who was very, very calm? Be, be, you know, thirty seconds before the knock on the door. Were you somebody who went to some pretty dark places to get yourself ready? Were you somebody who? Screamed and shouted and headbutted. I can't imagine it was the latter. But what were you? What was your test match animal like? For me, it was it was pretty calm. I was uh, wanting to be as relaxed as I could. Um, I think once you've you've done this for a long time, and once you've played so many games, you you just know what you need to do as an individual. Um, and so for me, really, it was just about making sure I was relaxed, and I knew that I'd done the preparation, and if I had. Um, it didn't matter really what I did before kickoff. I could I could switch it on because I knew what I needed to do. Um, and so really, I just wanted to be in the right space, which was calm, relaxed, but certainly ready to go. Um, and yeah, probably um, got the team going a bit more than you know. And by by saying some words yourself as a leader, as a captain, you know, got yourself naturally up as well. Fascinating. It seems to be that success now comes with cool heads rather than... I mean, I grew up on the French props in the 80s and 90s who came onto the field with bloody noses and black eyes because they had butted the balls. But that, that part of the game is long gone, probably for a good reason. 
Second question. I, 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 am I right in saying that when you were seven at Drury Rugby Club, Michael Jones handed out the prizes? And I, I just wonder if he'd whispered in your ear at that point, 127 caps, two World Cup winners medals, 52 tests as an all-black skipper and a place amongst the very greatest that rugby union has seen. I just wonder what a seven-year-old Kieran Reid would have made of that. Um, yeah, it would have been pretty shocked. They would have thought, um, yeah, I think there's no way. I, I think you'll take that any day of the week, wouldn't you? <laughs> it's um, you know, it's one of those ones that you just don't expect. I think you know, you grow up with dreams in New Zealand, and I had those dreams to be an All Black, and it's it's the definition of them coming true. If you if you think about those, what I've been able to achieve, and and just being able to play for the All Blacks, um, you know, it was a, it was a massive dream come true. So um, it was yeah, pretty special um, to do all that. I love. There's almost a sort of sense of disbelief when you hear it back. I just wonder whether you, whether you feel, yeah, rugby, I completed it, or whether you are one of those obsessives who sort of looks back and, I'm, I'm hoping it's the former. It should be the former, but I just wonder whether you are one of those people who is happy with their lot in the game. Well, hundred percent, I'm happy. Um, yeah, I enjoyed it, and I actually, you know, I want to give back as much as I can to this game. It's a great game. And, um, you know, it's another reason why I'm here in Japan. You know, it's um, exciting to try and help uh, new cultures grow the game. And um, look, I owe a lot to to rugby, and it's made me as a person. And um, you know, I'm really happy with what I've been able to achieve and 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 do through this game. So, um, look, I'll you know, I'm sure I'll probably like I haven't put up any jerseys and things at home. I'm sure I'll probably get around to that. Um, Maybe now that I'm finished, I can maybe put up a jersey or two around the house. My wife will probably kick me into my own room, so she won't want to see any. Um, so I'll be locked in my man cave. But, you know, just something to remind those boyfriends who come around and try and um, take my girls out. Just tell them, hey, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good. Relax. Very Wait. strong statement. Look at the wall, kid. Look at yeah. the wall. Yeah. Yo, you're going to need yeah. a big yeah. house yeah. to put just all that fucking shit. Play some highlights, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, sit him down. Sit down in that chair. Right, watch this. Here's me hitting I'm, him. I'm, I'm, Here's me hitting him. Here's me hitting him. If you touch my daughter, look out. On YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just yeah, want you to open the door with two World Cup winners medals, super like Mr. T. You'd have more jingle jangle jewelry jewelry than um, the most rugby players in the game. Um, and sort of f final final subject, really. Where's your happy place now? You, you've spoken a lot about family, which is obviously incredibly important to you, but where where are you at your happiest nowadays yeah look for yeah for me it's home it definitely is home um so i've got a little bit of space ar around home so just getting on my lawnmower to be honest and you know chucking some music in and um yeah just enjoying enjoying the outdoors mate and um also too i was actually quite surprised like watching watching the all blacks uh this year I actually bloody enjoyed it you know as a fan just be able to sit down and watch so it's a it show i still still love the game i still uh enjoy watching some some footy and different sport as well so um yeah i still support them um 100 um as it moves on and it's the million dollar question really but what's next do you want to coach media columnist yeah oh, who from? knows mate um yeah I'll, i don't know like so i'll finish up here in the middle of the year in japan and then um get back to new zealand and you know probably take a little bit of time just to figure out exactly what it is I want to do. So um, finishing some study around some management stuff at the moment. Um, like I'm really interested in leadership and, and trying to help people in, in, in those ways. So that could be sport or business and, and different things as well. So, you know, I'll um, keep looking for some opportunities and see what, see what opens up. Open for approaches. Exactly. Um, good on you. We'll, 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 we'll put the word out. Um, <laughs> Hask, what 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 fun! I mean, it's just you know, Kieran. It's it's been a real joy to have you on. One of the game's greats, um, you know, one of the most decorated players out there, and just really nice to have a yarn. Um, and I mean, Hask, we're, we're we're lucky to to use your phone book in this way, but it's been a real a real treat. Well, look, I mean, first I was shocked that actually Kieran even replied to my my Instagram message. <laughs> it, it was nice because I thought he was going to absolutely pie me because I I actually. It's one of those things I talked about to Dylan Hartley about it is that I've always been, even if I don't necessarily know people that well, I've always wanted to like reach out. Like I remember, 
you know, his, his 100th cap or his retirement. I, I just, you know, I wanted to, to reach out and just send a message because I, I think it's, it's important because for so many people, they either think you already know how good you were so you don't need to hear it or little moments kind of pass you by. And, and obviously in reflection, now I've retired um, to look what other people have achieved. And, you know, and, and, and Kieran Reed's had, you know, a, a, a dream career. And, a, and as you can see from today, is a, is, a, is a top guy. And I'm excited to see what happens next. And I love these podcasts because I had, an, I, I pictured you, and obviously the fact you were head boy, like I knew you were absolutely like, <laughs> like that. <laughs> Apple, for, Apple for teacher, sir, with your little shorts on. But I, I love the fact that you, you came from a school that wasn't like blueprint of rugby. I, I love the fact that you, you know, yes, you loved, you know, rugby and everything else like that, but you weren't like, I've got to be an all black. Like it was something you wanted to do. And I just think hearing about those kind of stuff and your approach to captaincy and, and, and everything else and how much you've, you've enjoyed your career. And also, like Alex said, seeing the surprise in your face when you actually re reel off the, the shopping list of, of achievements. I think it's amazing. And I think um, I, I'm excited to see what you, you, you do next. And feel free. <laughs> There's no pressure. If you're ever in the UK, <laughs> mate, I'm always up for the piss now. I, you know, there's no, there's no, yes, I might try and manage the rig, but I will have a beer. I will do whatever, <laughs> whatever, whatever needs to be done. I'm in for it. Yeah. Cheers, Hess. Alex, thank you guys for having me on. Uh, it's been a pleasure. It's, um, you know, as you said, it's, it's about these connections, isn't it? That's what you get out of the game. That's the biggest thing that I've always said is that it's the mates that you've made and the connections you've made over your time are the things that I'll, I'll remember most fondly. So uh, it's been a pleasure and uh, I'll definitely take you up on that, mate, when I'm up there. Good on you. You wear your greatness very lightly, Kieran Reid. It's been a real privilege to have you on. Thank you very much indeed. And that is it for this week's The Good, The Bad and The Rugby. Well done to Hask. Thank you to the legend that is Kieran Reid. Um, we did say at the start of the show that if 2021's guest list uh, was coming together as a team, it's going pretty well. Good luck stopping Pocock at open side, Mako Vunapola at loose head and Kieran at number eight. And we throw next week's guest into the mix as well. One of the game's uh, greatest wingers in the current uh, format and we're getting pretty close to unstoppable. Don't forget to go to the website where you'll find the latest from the Norse for all your Stato related information. It's also where you can find our latest ra range of merchandise if you'd like that, goodbadrugby.com. We are back in seven days time with one of the current hot steppers. We will see you then. Until then, thanks again, Kieran. Look after yourself and your family. Take it away for now though. Rob Brighton. Bye-bye. <laughs>